You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday True Crime Edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at The Professional Left, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Today, we talk about Joe Scarborough. Joe Scarborough has a long and contentious relationship with us basement-dwelling, Cheetos-stained liberal bloggers. They're, they're eating their Cheetos. Let me Google and Puerto Rican. He's wrong. He's and they've wrong. got dust flying. Yeah, Cheeto dust. dust flying all That'd over. Nice. They're, they're, they're trying to wa- they're wiping Cheetos. it on their bare chest while their Cheetos. underwear, you know, their hands. And they're, ooh, ooh. The bottom line is. And I just want to point out that audio clip is from 2008. Yeah. When he was defending John McCain against us liberal bloggers. Uh, that, that's the Iraq war defense. That's the last. The last defender of the Iraq war. Now, Drift Glass may differ from my opinion, but I'm participating in this no fair remembering stuff more in sorrow than in anger. Uh, Joe Scarborough and I have a lot in common. We both have a son with autism. We both love REM. We're about the same age. And we're both political junkies. And I think there is no one better who, if he was honest about his own past could write a juicy tell-all about Donald J. Trump and the Republican Party. I think it would be a great book. I I agree. I totally agree. No, because of the caveat, he has to be honest about his own past. Yeah. And lying about his past is Joe Scarborough. It's the theme of the show. the theme of the show. (laughs) Now, Joe has been known to us liberal bloggers for decades as Squint, and Mika Brzezinski was known as The Meat Puppet. So if you go through our blogs and see references to those, you'll know who we're talking about. He's now known mostly for his loud public feud with Donald Trump and Trump's henchmen. And the operative term there is loud, because that's one of the two gears that Joe Scarborough has. The other one is swaggering know-it-all condescension. Scarborough exudes the vibe of one of Stephen King's gone-to-seed ex-high school jock assholes, like Carrie's Billy Nolan and Christine's buddy Repperton, although grown up and more subtle now, but still used to getting their way by intimidation and manipulation, which is probably why he and Trump hit it off so well. They're both built from the same materials. Scarborough has a huge amount of clout at MSNBC, which is why you rarely hear anyone talking out of school about him. In 2005, Chris Licht, who is now president of CNN, was hired by Scarborough to be his executive producer for Scarborough Country and later was the founding executive producer of Morning Joe. Lick was reportedly Scarborough's loyal henchman, sabotaging other shows, trying and succeeding in getting their guests banned until he moved on to CBS in 2011. Lick reappeared in the cable news universe when he was named president of CNN this year. In February of 2022... Joe Scarborough said it was a great, no-nonsense choice that would bring a refreshing perspective to CNN. And later that year, it was reliably reported that Licht was allegedly in secret talks to poach Scarborough and Brzezinski from MSNBC to CNN. The rest of the on-air talent at MSNBC clearly knows what kind of influence Scarborough has over everyone else's show up to and including veto power over which guests get booked and which get banned. In 2010, Scarborough got into a Twitter fight with Daily Coast founder Marcos Melitzas. And instead of letting it go, Scarborough had then MSNBC president Phil Griffin ban Melitzas from appearing on the network. The ban was supposedly temporary, but Melitzas has not appeared on MSNBC since. Contrast this with another incident, also from 2011, 
when MSNBC censored Ann Coulter when she referred to John McCain as a, quote, douchebag while on Morning Joe. She went on to refer to the late Senator Ted Kennedy as, quote, human pestilence, unquote, which got the panelists quite pissed, though not enough to address the matter after the show and not enough to get Coulter banned from the network. Nope. Now, examples of Scarborough bullying his colleagues, berating his guests, and treating his co-host and eventual wife, Mika Brzezinski, like a disobedient child or pet are legion. Still, for our purposes, we're going to focus on a few of the most egregious examples. And to set the scene, we need to go back to June 16th of 2015, the day Donald Trump announced that he was running for president. The 2015 Republican presidential field of 17 candidates broke the record for most candidates running for president from one party at one time, surpassing the 16 candidates in the Democratic Party presidential primaries of 1972 and 1976. And no candidate in that huge field had a greater friend and promoter on television than Donald Trump had in Joe Scarborough. Trump called in whenever he felt like it, rambled about whatever he pleased for as long as he liked, and yucked it up with his good friends, Joe and Mika. Joe, a former Florida congressman, was also very likely a member of Trump's Mar-a-Lago Country Club before 2016. By December of 2015, Trump was beating every other GOP candidate in the polls. And as he's still calling into his pal Joe Scarborough's show at least once a month to ramble on as long as he wanted. This amounted to millions of dollars worth of free publicity for a candidate who by now was running an openly racist campaign and yet was still welcome on Scarborough's show. On December 8, 2015, his call-in turned contentious when Brzezinski said Trump's call to ban Muslims from entering the U.S. was scaring many people and that it was fueling hatred and alienation and possibly something worse. As Trump continued to speak, Scarborough instructed his producers to cut to commercial, and they did as he kept talking. When you say you're afraid, I think you should be afraid. You should be afraid of the other side, not my side. I want to get our hands around a very difficult situation. All right, right, Donald. Hold on, Donald. Donald, 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 you got to let us ask questions. You can't just talk. No, you got to let us actually ask questions. You're just talking. All Muslims. Donald, 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 Donald. Donald, Donald, You're not going to keep talking. We will go to break if you keep talking. We're going to ask you questions. All right, go to break. Go to break, everybody. Go to break. Go to break. Go to break right now. We'll be right back with more Morning Joe. When they came back from break, however, Trump was still there and still talking and was on for 28 more minutes taking questions from the panel. But was Trump banned from MSNBC for his thuggish racism as Marcos had been over some tweets? Of course not, because Scarborough has always had wider ambitions than hosting a morning cable show. Back in 2012, Scarborough was seriously considering a presidential run in 2016. He told Vanity Fair he was working to position himself for a shot in the next presidential election. And since that was clearly never, ever going to happen, riding his friend Trump's coattails, flattering him, and giving him virtually unlimited free publicity seemed like the next best thing. Leaked audio from a commercial break during an interview with Trump in February of 2016 shows that despite Trump's increasingly unhinged and incendiary rhetoric, he and Joe and Mika were still the best of pals. What do you have after this? I make a speech, uh, get on a plane, make a speech. I'm working. Well, I'll tell, tell you what, the Bloomberg poll, all, all the polls out today look great one, in South huh? Carolina. All of them. Yeah. They look good. Well, you know, so, but I'm being hit. You know, they're spending $75 million in negative ads on me over the last two weeks. Are they catching on at all? No. Don't look at what way. do you think? Are they catching on? No. They're Who's vicious. That? They're spending a tremendous amount on negative ads on me. No. You know what I thought was the um, kind of wow moment was the guy you brought up on stage. Yeah, that was great. Um, we played it several times this morning. We played it up against Obama. The both guys. The both, both guys. guys. Oh, yes, we played Obama first. The young guy and was And then the we champ. played the guys. I saw it. I watched your show this morning. Oh. You have me almost as a legendary figure. I like. Well, I tell you, this morning, what we, what we basically said today was we were completely wrong about the totally. debate. Totally. Yeah. 
I thought. I thought I did really well in the debate show, I have to tell you. I didn't. Yes, Alex? Three viewer questions. You, you did not, right? Oh, my God. I was like, he's melting down. I think his really? head's going to explode. I thought your head was going to explode. We were wrong. I did. We thought what? We your head wrong. was going to explode. Oh, no. Yeah. I thought I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. My daughter was screaming the by, by the way, By the way, he told me, he goes, I was having fun. Oh, my God. <laughs> Right. We have one more segment. One more segment, and then we're good. Thank you for doing this. Okay. I'm doing it because I, I said, get nothing. You know, you get, you get great ratings and a raise. Mm-hmm. Me, I get nothing. We're getting a real window into your... So... Well... Just make us all look good. That's right. Exactly. So how come Drudge and Time Magazine said I won the debate, Joe, and you think it's... Well, but, but so did, so did the, the CBS poll. The next morning when I saw the CBS poll, so that I knew... Second, but they yeah, have. but still, I knew. I knew that... The people that mattered didn't think you lost it. They, I mean, you came in a strong second. And I'll tell you what was the most revealing thing is Bush came in the last. Yeah, he came in last. The guy you fought weak. came in last. He's a weak person. And, and at that point, I said to Mika, we don't know what you know, going to happen. Said so. He's a weak person. Oh, okay. do you don't want me to do um, the ones with the, um, um, deportation? We really have to get to some questions. Back. That's right. Nothing, nothing too hard, Mika. Okay. Well, there's a cat. Look at that. No, it, um, I think that was, for most people in the Republican establishment, sort of the final sign. Looking good. Because we'll after this. Happens. Hey, we'll see what happens. Uh, so uh, what are the chances that something bad could happen on Saturday for me? It's always a chance, right? I, listen, it, this isn't, an, it, it's like I said before Iowa. I said, I can't tell you if Trump's ahead. I can't tell if he's going to win or not. Because no, there is ahead of us. But I said, but, but it's a caucus state. In primary states, look how close New Hampshire was. The polls were almost identical. You can take a mix of these polls. The polls are And pretty you can good. just overlay it. Except with caucus, because they change Except their mind. Except for caucus. Caucuses, they should get rid no, of No, Nevada. Oh, it's terrible. Nevada's a caucus state. I'm winning by 50%. But you're so far up in Nevada, according to this latest poll. Um, they have a great building yeah. there. That was interesting with China, wasn't it? To me, that's very. Yeah. They are ripping us. No, it's a, no, no, it's a great. No, that's a great question. What? That's a great. To question. China? No, they're telling me a question I ask you. <laughs> I can see, look at this. I see you shaking. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. When's the last time you've golfed? Yes. I yes. played uh, four days Actually, ago. Actually, it's good. I need to. Fix my dress anyway. Yeah. There's first, no way. First of all, I played, you know what? I played with Lexi Thompson, yeah. who's the great young player. Yeah. I played nine holes. I didn't want to play anymore because, you know, I'm thinking about no, this. No, no, you I, can't. I don't yeah. even There's care. no way. I don't even do care. 30 seconds. Just can't do it. Good. Good. 15. Oh, great. Oh, two more. Two more. Okay, great. Good Lord. Two more what sections? Two more blocks, yeah. Two more. Seven. I get nothing from you. That sounds That's a good. Nice, that's well, good. you know what? You know what? I, I, the, I'll uh, talk about the Ron Fournier thing. Oh, well, leave tight. him out of it. Okay, he's, I got it. I got uh, it. You know what? It's funny. He's sort of. He's, he understands God. now. Just. I mean, he's been he's been brutal. To there must be a delay. That guy has been brutal. Because oh, he, yeah, he was. I don't know about now. He was. I mean, absolutely, I can tell you, he, was, he was. He was. Some people have come. So over. Liz has completely changed. And what? So Liz has been fantastic. Say, one thing that I'm Ron so started doing about three months ago, he went home. He's from Michigan. I'm and fun. he got I'm an earful when he went home. And so he changed Bottom things. of one of the... Here, the, I got it. The people and, of Michigan. And what, he, Michigan. and what he said was, he said... I know. I'm me, no longer going to attack the people who support Trump. I got he said, it. I will basically take exception with Trump and what he said. To, he said, but I went... I basically said, I, got I went home. I spent a couple weeks back in Michigan. And he said, I understand understand more. Michigan's getting killed. Did What's you see it? where Ford now is moving another plant? You know, I've been talking about the plant well, for two have, years. Yeah. Now they're doubling Thank down. You. They're going to make it because nobody does I, anything I need this it. to yeah. roll at the end of the show. God, does it work? Nice, beautiful question. Is it working? How you doing? Good. It's working. Okay, great. So I'm going to read this and then you take the question. Well, this do, is kind of cool. Don't read the whole thing. No, no, no. I'm we doing like bullets. Time. No, just I'm doing like bullets. boom, 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 and then, and then just give it to you. I just want to ask a general question. Okay. Thank you. It's kind of good. This what is a beautiful bullet points. 
Nice set. Yeah. It's a beautiful set. I, I hate those one-word bullet points. No, 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 no it's you're going to be okay. No. We're not no. going to do that. <laughs> you know, don't you hate that? <laughs> yeah, we we. <laughs> you make, you we made did, news we when Nick did word, when we could do, when you did word association in New Hampshire. I almost that made to news. Cow. What made news? The Hillary. The Hillary did so bad. And the thing is, thing is, it was a strong statement. You sat there and you waited, so you thought about it. I never liked it. Everybody's talking about it. You. You get great ratings and a raise. Me, I get nothing, Trump said, after Trump tells them to, quote, make us all look good. And Scarborough replies, exactly. None of which is surprising. Brzezinski and Scarborough had been friends of Trump's for a decade. Scarborough spent Christmas at Mar-a-Lago with his kids in 2014 and 2015. And Trump stayed mum about the affair the couple was conducting. This was clearly quid pro quo or tit for tat. Were there any repercussions, any consequences for two MSNBC posts virtually climbing into bed with presidential candidate Trump, giving him millions in free publicity, promising to go easy on him? After all, this was the same network that had suspended Keith Olbermann indefinitely without pay after Politico reported that he had made three campaign contributions to Democratic candidates. By this time, it was clear that the MSNBC rules are for other people, not Joe Scarborough. Anyway, as often happens with meathead bullies when some otherwise innocuous event escalates into a brawl, a comment by Scarborough on Twitter, where else, about what a great time it would be for someone to run as a third-party candidate quickly blossomed into an out-of-control, chest-beating contest between these two thin-skinned meatheads over ratings and popularity. This was in May of 2016, not coincidentally the same month that Donald Trump all but wrapped up the GOP nomination and America's political pundits collectively crapped their underpants. And the summer meant keeping Trump's absurd and empty rally speeches front and center for ratings. Two weeks before the Republican convention, Morning Joe hosted Michael Steele and Mark Halperin to discuss how Donald got his groove back. Even that, even Bill Crystal was saying afterwards, that was something. <laughs> that was something. I, that so, was amazing. Some, he said, I'm not sure. Way, he but. was like, I'm not sure what I saw, but that was amazing. No, I'll tell you what you saw. What you saw him connecting with the crowd in a way that no other politician in the history of politics that we know ever could. You can imagine a Republican candidate going up there and talking about his golf course in Turnberry without getting killed. Remember the car <laughs> elevator and all sorts of things that plagued Mitt uh-huh. Romney? This guy talks about his Turnberry golf course and everybody in the audience is with him Yeah. about the construction project and about his son and they actually feel they could own a golf course in Turnberry. He connects. He He connects. He does, but I guess the question still begs itself. Uh, You got these these golden nuggets that are being handed to you. Yes. So instead of riffing on Chuck Todd, Yes. Riff on that. I mean, well, Chuck talk- Todd actually was. A, I mean, he had to come around a little bit on the show yesterday, but yeah. he he was he nailed Hillary Clinton to the wall on this stuff. You're, you're talking his about. Speech. Well, there's a tale, and so Mark Halpern, you were there last night, and it's a tale of two speeches. It's the speeches that the audience sees, and delivers. Because yesterday we were very critical, but. Uh, 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 Mika was not of of not focusing enough on Hillary, and then later on we ran the part where he was going through the routine of how long can you really talk about grandchildren? I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. And how long can you yeah. really talk about golf? Okay, that's your two and a half minutes. What else did they talk about for 25, 26, 27, 28 minutes? Now, of course, at this point, everybody's going, oh, they're supporting Donald Trump at home. Everybody's freaking out. No. How oh, they're racist, they're bigots, no, they hate Jews, they hate Hispanics. No, we're just talking about what we saw last yeah. night on television. We talked about Mark Halpern, a guy who looks re-energized. I kept looking Happy. at him going, is this guy really 70 years old? And the believe. audience was eating it up. From there... Trump got steadily worse. The 2016 RNC nominating convention in July was a four-day freak show. For the Beltwaiter Insiders Club, it suddenly wasn't such a great thing to have been Trump's number one hype man. While at the same time, nothing could be worse than to be a target for Trump's unhinged Twitter rage and his army of zombie followers. And somehow, Scarborough had managed to do both. So it was time for some serious damage control 
which blew up in a gloriously spectacular way in October when Joe, Mika, and Bill Crystal tried to hang the blame for Trump's nomination all over each other. Here, right. Bill Crystal, it's all about changing dynamics. You got to yeah. change the dynamics. The poll numbers are breaking in such a way over the past week. Very bad news for Donald Trump. He's got to reverse those. Did anything happen last night that would have made anybody change your mind and go back to Donald Trump? No, but I think something happened that would make some people leave Donald Trump. But I, I don't like, I mean, yes, on style points, Trump was a little yeah. better in the first 30 minutes, and right. he had a couple of clever insults, right. and she had some insults. But, but that's not the point. The headline out of this debate is obviously the failure to say ahead of time that you'll accept the results of the Democratic election in America. Pretty unprecedented. It doesn't mean that there's going to be violence in the streets. Certainly not if others now say that. Who cares what Donald Trump says? So what should, Repu- fluke, what should Republicans say? He's going to be a failed, say? fluke presidential candidate. What should he Republicans should ignored, say? He should be ignored on election night. And Republicans need to say that. Wait, and especially, uh, Yes, he fluke people, he won the nomination in a fluky way. A, a fluky him. way? Not a fluke. Well, I'm, I hope he it was a fluke. He beat like 16 people. He did, and that's because unfortunate. the Republican Party nominated him. I agree, and some and Republicans have refused to support him, and he's going to lose the general that's not election. A fluke. And he's well, I think it was a fluke in some ways, and in other ways, he tapped into some deep anxieties. I mean, he got a minority a of the vote. A fluke is something. He not got a expected. minority of the vote. Okay, fine. You can play the Republican Party. <laughs> feel bad. Does that make you feel better? Does that make you feel better about yes, it? Yes, you, you feel great because the Republican Party uh, nominated a uh, guy who's really a bad guy as president, and you think it's funny and amusing. No, I actually. I think Republicans need to come clean on themselves. Well, thank including you. Including leaders of the Republican Party. What does Party? come clean on themselves mean? Just they be oppose... honest about what's right and wrong. And well, what's wrong is Donald Trump. Trump. This uh, show, this I, show, this I show was very tough. This show was really tough on Trump in 20, late 2015 and early 2016. We are, were. We gonna, are you going to pretend that? We were. Oh, um, if, that's, if that's your way of rewriting his story, that's fine. You mean when Joe went up on him and he wouldn't answer a question? You mean when we peppered him with questions? A lot of people accommodated A lot of people accommodated Donald Trump at different times. I think I'm, but I'm not going to get into it. We don't well, no, 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 you just this. did. Uh, you you wow. lied. Please I don't did not come lie. on my air and lie. You said in late 15, in early December 2000, I, I can't even believe you're doing this. I don't know why you're so bitter. You're I'm not bitter. Completely. I'm trying to you, say the Republicans, I'm trying to say the Republicans crying. need to. You're practically crying. In I am early, upset about this election. That's right, Joe. In early, early December, in early December 2015, we compared it to Germany 1933, what he was doing. Really? Oh, really? We got you know. And you treated him that way when he called in. Is that right? Well, yeah, we treated you him. You treated him tough. You asked the most tough questions. We did. Look, we don't need Listen, to get into this. Well, we right, agree no, on it's this too now. late. It's too late. You're bitter. You come on here I'm, practically crying. We've got it on tape. You're screaming at Mika. You don't even know what she's going to say, which is the same thing that you were going to say. Right, which so is me, why is Paul Ryan? Why uh, are Mitch that McConnell? Is what I'm why? No, but that's what Mika was going to say. Well, but we're in agreement. Well, then don't attack us. And I'm not attacking you guys. The fact of the matter is, the question is, why does Paul Ryan still endorse him? Why does Mitch McConnell still endorse him? Why do all these Republicans still endorse him? It's a great question. It By the way, question. while you're attacking me personally, I said from the beginning, I would never vote for him. You and I, I said I was this. voting for Jeb Bush. Well, then I said I was voting for John Kasich. Then we said after the Muslim ban that this is what Germany looked like in 1933. So I don't know sorry where you get up. Sorry if he was easy up. on him. I mean, if, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we were okay. easy on him. If that's, if that's if comparing him to Hitler in 1933 is going easy on him, and like that was three months before anybody voted, then we were easy on him. Then good on you. you know, the if question, you guys, the bigger if question is, if you behaved if, in a great you, way, we more did. power to you. We did. If you want like to answer and I the question agreed. now, what? Should Paul, let's start with Paul Ryan. Yeah. Because we've been asking that question. He should from say, I've said this for three months. He should say he should, does not support Donald Trump. Every Republican And what if he doesn't? Then it's what, what not a good? fluke. Well, what does that mean? It's not a fluke. Well, what it means is the most powerful Republicans in America are still endorsing him. Yes, and well, I'm very unhappy Paul about this. Ryan, right. a legitimate contender for president in 2020 if he does not withdraw his endorsement of Donald Trump? You know, that's honestly hard to say. I would have trouble supporting someone in 2020 who has rationalized Trump. Now, Ryan's gone pretty far in distancing himself from Trump, to be fair. He's still to Ryan, endorsing compared it. Compared to others. But he is still saying he should be president of the United States, which is not a judgment I agree with. It's not a judgment you two agree with. It's not a judgment lots of people agree with. It's not a judgment most Americans are going to agree with. But practically speaking, in the current, next two and a half weeks, Republicans need to say that the election is legitimate what and about democratic. Mike well, people who support, this is the key though, the people who support Trump need to say this, but Trump will get 40 million votes or something like that.
ballot or 50 million votes, and there can be danger if those voters think the election is illegitimate. What about Mike So Pence? I don't have any credibility. Is Mike, credibility. Is, is Mike yes. disqualified? Yes, I think so. Mm. I think so. And I think Chris Christie and Rudy Giuliani and Mike Pence and all these Republicans who've run for office and have won lost need to say, you need to say ahead of time, but there, you need to say, we need to say as a country that the election is legitimate and we need to abide by the election results. If Donald Trump wants to be a sore loser on November 8th, he can be a sore but, loser. But he didn't say the key is to, to ignore him. He didn't say he was going to do that. He said he was going to leave. I just he was going to leave it up in the air He's to see what, what, what's he going to see? Well, so what's maybe he going we'll to see what happened in two, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm just well, saying. Fine, you can challenge elections. No, I mean, uh, 2000, Minnesota, 2000, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008. You challenge them according to the rules. Yeah. I mean, Adrian Gonzalez was probably safe at home plate in the second inning last night, and he, there's a photo showing that, and he's complaining about it, but the Dodgers accepted the result of the game, and, and they right. said, and ahead of time, they said they right. would accept as the result of the game. As will everybody else. Oh, and, and, yes, I agree with that. Okay, I, I agree true. with that. This was all part of Scarborough's campaign to yell and bully his own despicable past out of existence, and to create a new fantasy history in which he and Mika had always been Trump's toughest critics. Then Trump won, and suddenly it became important for Scarborough to mend fences. And so, this is from Politico in December of 2016. The on-again, off-again relationship between Donald Trump and MSNBC's Morning Joe is on again. A saga that included co-host Joe Scarborough comparing Trump policies to Nazi-era Germany, and the candidate tweeting that co-host Mika Brzezinski is, quote, crazy and very dumb, unquote, has taken a distinctly positive turn. Because Scarborough wants what he wants when he wants it, just like Trump. Even when he wants two diametrically opposed things, he uses his bulldozer personality and backroom clout to get it. He wanted all the perks that came with riding the Trump train, but didn't want to take any responsibility when that train ran off the rails. And so he simply outshouted anyone who brought the subject up. But he also wanted to be a political player. So he smoothed things over with Trump enough so that by January of 2017, Joe Scarborough was coaching Donald Trump on his speech to Congress and was even in the audience in the very House chamber applauding during the speech. But see, Scarborough also wants to be considered a tough but fair journalist, which he manifestly is not. So when Maggie Haberman who was covering Donald Trump's New Year's Eve festivities three weeks before the inauguration, noted that Scarborough and his MSNBC co-host Brzezinski were among the Mar-a-Lago revelers. Scarborough went completely ballistic and made up some bullshit about he just being there to line up an interview. On New now, Year's Eve. On New Year's Eve, because that's because <laughs> a phone call or seven wouldn't do, even though he mm -hmm. called into the show once a month like clockwork. Right, right. So, yeah, no one believed that. Now, if you or I, Blue Gal, got caught in a mildly embarrassing situation, we might or might not be tempted to try to bluster our way out of it. But unlike Joe Scarborough, we don't have four hours of cable TV time every damn morning at our command where we can grind our axes. We also don't have a regular gig at the Washington Post where we can further grind our axes for audiences that might not watch our TV show. But Joe Scarborough does. And this is from Margaret Sullivan, who also wrote at the time in the Washington Post. The Post piece proves a couple of other points. One, that Scarborough is almost as thin-skinned as Trump himself. Scarborough's opinion piece, he writes regularly for the Post, may have been headlined, The Media's Hypocrisy and Hyperventilating in the Age of Trump, but it was in part a convoluted defense of his interactions with the man, complete with language like this, quote, this past week, I met twice with President-elect Donald Trump attempting to secure an interview for inauguration week. Bullshit. Second, he has an extraordinarily high opinion of himself and his place in the political firmament. Pointing to past relationships between American politicians and journalists, he invoked some of the greats, indirectly comparing himself to Edward R. Murrow Ben Bradley, and Walter Lippmann. And the thing is, none of this is surprising. Back in 2008, when Scarborough was using his MSNBC spot to flack for John McCain's doomed campaign on an MSNBC panel, which included Scarborough, Rachel Maddow, and Harold Ford Jr. Remember Harold Ford Jr.? <laughs> Barely, And yeah. moderated by David Gregory. Remember David Gregory? 
Rachel Maddow went after Scarborough for his blatant hypocrisy. Remember when hypocrisy was a thing? Yeah. Uh, Scarborough reacted by trying to shout and overtalk and condescend his way out of a hole he had dug for himself in front of Rachel Maddow. Mm-hmm. It was it was ugly. It, it yeah. was like, you know, people who understand politics, Rachel. Associates yeah. and ahead, friendships please. become an issue when political opponents decide to make them an issue. And so we talked about this before on this show. I mean, the Jeremiah Wright. It's all about Joe, defining. Joe, wait, let, Joe, let me make defining. my point and then you can dismiss me. Uh, let me make my point first. The Jeremiah Wright as a pastor for Barack Obama is an issue. The political associations that John McCain has made with other with right wing pastors have not been an issue. The issue of, that has been made about who's given money to Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton because their opponents have decided to go after them on that. But for example, John McCain had this incredibly controversial relationship with his Florida campaign co-chair, who was caught in a bathroom offering money to a police officer to do something that we can all imagine in a bathroom. Nobody's going to John McCain about that and saying, he was your Florida campaign co-chair? What do you think about men doing that in bathrooms? What do you think about entrapment from police officers? What do you think That's about public general election is Nobody cool. brought that <laughs> stuff. But nobody's brought that stuff up to John McCain at this point, and it's a decision made by political opponents. It's not something that happens organically because of how long you've been around the block. Joe, what are you seeing tonight? Well, I, I think I may, I may blow all my time on the prediction to respond to Rachel. I don't engage in crossfire type debates, and certainly I don't want to talk about what people do in bathrooms. I do want to say, though, that anybody, and you can ask Harold Ford, you can ask anybody that's ever run for political office, that the thing you want to do is define your opponent. You define opponents that people don't know more easily than defining opponents that have been in public service for a quarter of a century. It was the only point I was trying to make, and again, I, I don't do crossfire, so if we want to yell back and forth, then Rachel will have to find somebody else no, to do that. I wasn't trying to yell back and forth you. I was starting to make my point, and you cut me off before I started my first sentence. That's mm-hmm. all I was... Okay. You waited for me to start. I started and then right. you jumped in. Well, I don't mean to be condescending, uh, but I can say that anybody that's ever run for political office before knows that there's a big difference between John McCain and defining him, who's been in public service for 25 years, and defining Barack Obama, who was in Washington, D.C. for one year before he decided to run for president. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut this particular debate down and move on. John, your, uh, your thought about what's going All right, Rachel, your thoughts tonight. First of all, Joe and I will go out to a be- for, uh, go out for a beer and hash this all out. That's my plan. <laughs> what crown royal for this beer fest these guys about to have? Uh... Just... <laughs> so finally, unable to fluster her, he took off his mic and stormed off. When Scarborough was trying to hype John McCain's doomed campaign by pumping up false poll numbers, Keith Olbermann told him he should get a shovel. It got worse from there. Perhaps because of Steve Schmidt's new leadership on the McCain campaign, the fact that McCain campaign has been leaning forward with one message, and there are plenty of problems with that message, according to some McCain people, a a shovel. I I mean, seriously, Joe, the man just lost the... uh, I did. The man just lost seven points in the likely voter poll, McCain did, uh, from last week, from uh, last month, from USA Today's a likely voter poll, the higher level one, the supposedly more sophisticated one. It was 49-45 McCain last month. It's 48-45 Obama. Back up what they, what they're saying or what you're saying. Well, I mean, get a shovel, Keith. My God, if you look where John McCain's been over the past three, four months, this is a guy that's been losing state by state. As Chuck Todd and Pat Buchanan was saying a few weeks ago, it was a long, hard slog. Now you look at Missouri, those polls are looking close for McCain. You look at Florida, those polls are looking uh, closer for McCain. You talk about getting a shovel, my God. The McCain campaign's not saying they think they're going to win. The McCain campaign thinks they have gotten a shovel, they have dug out of a grave, and at least they've got a chance to make this race competitive. They think if they keep it close, they're in good shape. On the other side of it, Keith, though, if this convention had been held two weeks ago, then this would have been more of a coronation than a convention. Two weeks ago, 
Democrats were extremely confident, especially in Barack Obama's own campaign. Their top officials believing that this was their campaign to lose. Now, after two weeks of some very tough smash mouth politics, they believe they're in for a fight. Do they believe they still have the advantage? Sure. Does the McCain campaign believe that Obama still has an advantage? Sure. When you've got right track, wrong track polls that are showing 82 percent of Americans are going, believe this country is going in the wrong direction. When you've got George W. Bush sitting at 28 percent and can't do anything to get above 30 percent in a lot of polls. Obviously, this is going to be a big Democratic trending year. However, both campaigns believe for the first time it may be a fight. Well, are we done? <laughs> well, hey, if you want to be done, so let me thank you very yeah, much. Would you like me to get another shovel? <laughs> no, I thought it was great. It was shovel to shovel. Thank you very much, Joe Scarborough. All right. In fact, since joining us in the podcast world, welcome Keith Olbermann. Welcome, Keith. Yeah. Olbermann has made quite a little side gig out of recounting the many ways Scarborough bullied and sabotaged his way to the top of the MSNBC's food chain. And now we have to go back in time even further, back to when Scarborough first ran for Congress in 1994. Now, you may not remember them, but before MAGA Republicans and Tea Party Republicans and Young Gun Republicans, there was a hard right wing group of fanatics that called themselves the New Federalists. They hated Bill Clinton and they hated the federal government, and they were on a mission to get rid of them both. Scarborough was a new Federalist and elected along with the rest of them as part of Gingrich's class of 1994. And here's the thing. Scarborough was very pro-government shutdown and was crestfallen when it ended with Clinton winning and then Speaker Gingrich caving. And for solace, he turned to fellow new Federalist Sam Brownback. Remember Sam Brownback? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who told him, don't worry, Joe, even Rome wasn't burned in a day. Now, while in Congress... Scarborough supported a number of anti-abortion bills. He also sponsored a bill to force the U.S. to withdraw from the United Nations. He voted to eliminate federal funding for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. He also voted for the Medicare Preservation Act of 1995, which cut the projected growth of Medicare by $270 billion over 10 years. And he voted against raising the minimum wage to $5.15. Scarborough was also one of the 228 members of the House who voted to impeach Bill Clinton in December of 1998. Now, that was all a quarter of a century ago. And yet, despite reasons to fire his ass spread across decades by shape-shifting every few years to accommodate changes in the prevailing political winds, Scarborough has remained untouched. In 2015, Scarborough got his big mad on by scolding Barack Obama for his arrogant which means uppity, assertion that bad-mouthing the poor was something that conservatives actually do. If we're going to change how John Boehner and Mitch McConnell think, we're going to have to change how our body politic Mm -hmm. thinks, which means we're going to have to change how the media reports on these issues. I mean, I don't know where to start. At a bipartisan summit, you decide to attack a cable news channel as the problem. And saying that Roger Ailes calls people leeches and Roger Ailes' network calls people leeches, sponges, and lazy, that, first of all, at at a summit that's supposed to bring both sides together in poverty is stunning to me. Secondly, and I guess this is the problem, Barack Obama says, if we are to change the way that John Boehner and Mitch McConnell think, then we have to change news we Change the way they think? Is, is, is he really the sole arbiter of what is right and just? Is he the only one who cares about the poor? Could it be that a lot of people like me don't think that a top-down approach and Triple, trickle-down liberalism works any more than trickle-down conservatism. The arrogance to say if we are to change the way our opponents think, you know what? Maybe he needs to change the way he thinks. Well, the I, arrogance of it all is staggering. People have disagreed in this country 
since George Washington had Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton together in the same cabinet. You work out differences. That's a creative friction. It's not, I'm right, you're wrong. That is such an illuminating moment in this presidency. I'm a little embarrassed for him. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, Joe, I have to disagree with you. And, but I can understand where you're coming from, given the clip that we just showed, and it was a clip. But the entire conversation uh, revealed an aspect of the president that I think is wholly admirable because he has a grip on a big problem in this country today. He referenced it several times. We no longer know who the poor are. And it wasn't just about poverty, and it wasn't just about race yesterday. There's a huge element of class in this country that he spoke to. And he spoke to... He spoke what, what, to what about this specific clip about Fox News calling uh, poor people, leeches, sponges, and lazy. Have you ever heard that on Fox News? No, no I have not. Has anybody ever heard that I have on not. Fox News? But I think he was talking... Has anybody? No, I, this is important. I don't really watch. Has anybody I mean, I ever watched anybody seen. call the poor lazy, yes. sponges, yes. and leeches? I, you hear that yeah. all. Turn on the radio. Turn on talk right radio. Ring radio. Turn on that, talk I, radio. I, I was talking about Fox News. I have not heard that on Fox yeah. News. But turn on the radio, yeah. you hear it all day long. And here's what I wrote about that back then. It's always bad on MSNBC these days watching the last flickering light of liberalism on TV slowly being snuffed out by the damp rag of Chuck Toddism. But watching the video of Squint thugging it up like the drunken asshole at the end of the bar this morning, double dog daring his minions to name one time, just one time, that anyone on Mr. Roger Ailes perfectly fair TV network had ever called poor people names, then watching his flunkies stare extravagantly at their shoe tops and pretend they had either never heard of Roger Ailes or were on some other TV studio entirely. That was all perfectly surreal and a perfect coda on the collapse of journalism in America. For a moment, Mike Barnacle, of all people, stood up on his hind legs to weakly refute the ravings of the goon who pays for his whiskey and hot pockets and then <laughs> flopped back down and took his place with the rest of the whip dogs. Morning Joe keeps around to massage his gargantuan ego. See, here's the thing. Everyone on that set knows Scarborough is lying. All of his minions know it, as does his little blonde meat puppet. Every camera and mic operator, every video editor, control room monkey, and pastry cart jockey knows he's lying. Everyone who's ever had to watch Fox News while waiting for an oil change knows he's lying. In fact, there's a non-trivial chance that the first message we receive from extraterrestrials will be a short greeting followed by a demand that Fox News shut the fuck up already with the poor bashing because they're embarrassing the entire quadrant. Whipping the crap out of the poor isn't a casual weekend thing for Fox. It's their entire business plan. And Scarborough fucking well knows it. The thing is, Scarborough isn't subtle. No. <laughs> he's not subtle. He's, he's not, not a smart not clever. man. He's, he's not, not a smart man. He's not sneaking this in under the no. transom. No. He just used the blunt force of his privileged position in the media to bludgeon everyone else into silence. And I, if I can just add an aside here. Of course. I had a hard time prepping for this show because I went to watch... All of the videos, many of the videos that we have listed at Crooks and Liars, just looking up Joe Scarborough in their vast archives and watching some clips of him on his show. There's one where uh, they're talking about Obama and whether he's hired enough women. And Mika uses the word chauvinist to describe the attitude that Joe Scarborough is taking. And Joe Scarborough, Joe Scarborough goes off on her yelling, snapping his fingers in her face. It is so abusive. And whether it's, she laughs her way through it, and perhaps it's an act, but it's an abusive act if it's an yep. act. Yep. And I found it just triggering and hard to listen to. Um, but he does that. He bludgeons people verbally. Yeah, it's his And it's show. how he's, he's been getting away with this for decades. Why, yeah. after decades of braying assholery, MSNBC rewarded him by adding an extra hour to his morning show, expanding it from three hours to four. 
which is still not enough to accommodate his gargantuan ego and ambition. Now, the stated reason for that expansion was that not enough West Coast viewers were catching up on the Morning Joe fabulousness. It's actually because the suits at MSNBC, after years of trying to go too far to the right and failing, just went with a product for which they didn't have to do show slash talent development. And that's the thing. Like all cable news shows, Morning Joe is a show used to promote products for advertisers. It's just filler in between ads for Skyrizia and Humera. The reason that Joe Scarborough continues to be who he is and where he is in the MSNBC food chain is because corporate ownership of MSNBC has decided that that is what makes them profitable. And the reason that Donald Trump got all of that free time on MSNBC and other networks was ratings. And that's why he became president. And that's why the cable news ecosphere did not suffer as a result of Donald Trump's presidency. No. Everybody else suffered. The nation yeah. suffered. Democracy suffered. But it was good for ratings. Yeah. yeah. It's like Les Moonves, who, what happened to him? I, oh, yeah, sexual harassment. That's right. You know, all these very bad people decided to make money off of this. Uh-huh. Make money because... Nothing was ever going to touch the elite Manhattan and Washington Beltway media. It would never come to their door. No. And it still hasn't. Well, their stocks are up. Their taxes are down. Joe Scarborough knows exactly what day in January he's going to stop paying Social Security taxes. And it'll never hurt him. No. No matter where democracy goes, no matter where our politics goes, he's on top. Well, and, and he, I mean, this is what happens when you give a megaphone to an asshole and just turn him loose. He mm-hmm. has decided after being Trump's number one fluffer that that was inconvenient and that would make him look stupid. So now he's the leader of the resistance. Right. And he gets to p- pretend he's to be the leader one, of the resistance. never Trumper. Yeah. Always has he, been, always will be. Right. Because he right. shouts louder than anybody and he puts people on his panel who only who agree with him. And he's sabotaging. Well, and when, he, when he's going to have a true never Trumper on, he's not there. No. He lets no. Willie do it. He lets sure. other people host the show and he's off he's off in his office someplace yeah he doesn't have to be there he doesn't need to be there anymore and and this is what it's very important to remember about these things that the emphasize we would like to emphasize these are shows these are performances these are scripted nearly scripted performances being done by people who were put on television because of what they look like and what they sound like mm-hmm. and honestly the power of the, the, the sheer power of television to you know, the, in a Patty Chayefsky kind of way, just reinvent people's reality, mm-hmm. just re- rewrite history. Joe Scarborough, boom, his whole history before 2016 gone. Matthew Dowd, whole history before 2017 gone. Now he's on MSNBC as a leader of the resistance, and yep. all of which is fine. They're, I will never begrudge someone their redemption, but these people don't admit they ever said anything different. They just on a Tuesday, flip a switch, and suddenly they're the exact opposite of who they were on a Monday, because that's mm-hmm. what's convenient and necessary for the network to do now. And that's why I get a little impatient with people who yell at Chuck Todd. I yell at Chuck Todd. I yell at Chuck Todd all the time, but Chuck Todd is not the problem. Chuck Todd is an employee of wealthy executives who put him in that chair to do exactly the shitty job he does every week. Before him, there was David Gregory. Yeah, and and after him, there will be some other stooge who will be there to sell Sky right. Rizzy and uh, dick pills and whatever it is you sell on Sunday morning. You know, a very yeah. wise person that we know once said, MSNBC is not our friend. MSNBC and, is not our friend. That's and right. you know what? It isn't. It isn't. It is a useful place for a few liberal voices to occasionally leak through to the greater blogosphere, to the greater media universe. But that's all it is. And the rest of the time... You, it's Katie Turr and the empty podium show. Everyone waiting for, Donald, yeah. Yeah, yeah. waiting for Donald Trump to show up. Remember, these people hired Greta Van Susteren, gave her <laughs> her own show, threw money at her, and nobody wanted to watch her. They, they got poor Rachel Maddow to come on and say, Greta's great. You should watch her. No, she's not. And nobody did. So now Greta Van Susteren is gone. She's back at uh, Newsmax, I think. They did mm-hmm. the same thing with Megyn Kelly. Desperate, desperate, desperate. Threw millions of dollars at her. Nobody wanted to hear her shit. Same thing with Hugh Hewitt. They threw millions of dollars at Hugh Hewitt, who was a cyborg sent from the future to destroy America, and gave him his own show. And nobody wanted him there. Nobody watched him because he, all these people just suck. They're all just 
avatars for the Republican Party. Right. MSNBC does not want to be a liberal network. They want to be Fox News Plus. They want to be Fox News if Combs had a slightly bigger role than that he did when he was Hannity and Combs. Mm -hmm. That's all they want. They want a bunch of, they really do think that out there somewhere there's this big audience of Republicans who just want the party to be what it was in 2015, back when Joe Scarborough was there calling liberals Cheeto smeared asshole. Right. Well, and it's an imaginary me- remembering. Right. It's a but fantasy no. that at one time the Republican Party was reasonable. And when right. you go back to Joe Scarborough's history as a congressman, you realize he wanted to separate us from the United Nations. Right. And and which was it it checked every box of conservative conspiracy mongering and asshole yeah. at the yeah. time. I mean, you go back I mean, and look, yeah. it's, it's Marjorie Taylor Greene eat your heart out. Yeah. Joe well, Scarborough 1994 is Marjorie Taylor Greene eat your heart out. And Joe Scarborough 1994 is Joe Walsh 2012. Yeah. You know, yeah. they both come in hating a Democratic president. They both come in, let's burn this place to the ground. They both milk it for all it's worth. They both eventually, uh, it gets too crazy for them. And they both go into the media business. Yeah. And these loud, dumb, right-wing meatheads are apparently, the MSNBC thinks that's who people want to listen to. Put a little blonde lady next to him that he can yell at sometimes or smirk at sometimes. And the constant condescension that nobody understands politics like I do is just is is unbearable. And I don't know that we're ever going to be cured of it. I don't know if we're ever going to get an answer as to why MSNBC executives think this is the best formula, but they do. And Joe Scarborough's constant reinvention of his political past and bullying of anyone who pushes back on him the slightest bit are part of keeping the show viable. Well, guess what, you guys? You are the biggest part of keeping this show viable. So here we go. A second show added to the professional left lineup. No Fair Remembering Stuff comes to you every week on Tuesdays, in addition to our regular Thursday current politics and media show. Now is the time to support our podcast work. We need you as Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. DGBG Productions.